Now I'm going to mute everyone else. Okay. And now I'm going to pass the presenter role to Dawn. Dawn is going to accept the presenter role. He is now the presenter. And um, you will be able to see his presentation. So I'm not going to introduce Dawn tonight. He's a world-class ice maker, but he has an excellent in introduction of his own. So during the uh, presentation, everyone is muted, but halfway through, we'll unmute and see what kind of questions there are. If you have any questions during the presentation, use the chat bubble. It's the little bubble up at the top of the page. Use that, and I will keep an eye on that and relay those questions to Dawn. So, Dawn, without any further babble from me, please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you, and I'm not hearing from anybody else. Okay. I cannot even hear you. I'll just ask. Okay. I guess it would help if I was actually talking. Um, can everybody hear? Me? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm getting I'm getting lots of yeses. Okay. Fabulous. Well, thank you everybody for tuning into my first ever webinar. Uh, thank you to Andrea for inviting me to do this. Her question to me was posed as to what what could an ICE technician offer to teams and to coaches, and what could you garner out of the experience that I have? Well, I'm going to be perfectly honest. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm curious to get your feedback at the end of it, and uh, hopefully I can make sense of a, a, a fairly complicated topic. So my name is Don Powell. I am a national level four ice technician. I live in Toronto. I have been the lead course conductor for the province of Ontario's ice program for many, many years now. And I am a third generation ice technician. So my career, although I'm showing you here, began at the Avonlea Curling Club, actually began much, much, much sooner than that. I am the youngest child of a former ice maker. And my father was, was smart enough to realize that I was not to be left alone. And so I spent a lot of time through my childhood at curling clubs. Uh, as any typical teenager, I did not pay attention to what my father was doing or, or take the opportunity to learn. I had no idea that I was going to be involved in ice making. I moved to Toronto to attend college and started a job at the Avonlea Curling Club working in the kitchen. Well, it wasn't long after that that I met Don Campbell, who at the time was looking after many curling clubs in Toronto, and he quickly put me to work. So out of the kitchen I went, and I've been involved in, in curling ice at many clubs in Toronto ever since then, and I've had the opportunity to get involved with many championship events. And there's many times that those championship events involve putting snow into a bucket. Uh, sometimes I had the opportunity of actually dumping. Oh, we just lost you, Dawn. Uh, you've lost me? Oh, um, I got you back. Got you back. What, what so I, I, do about I, that? Okay. I think it's when you transition to the new slide. So when you transition yes. to the new slide, just pause for a moment, and then okay. the slide will load, and then you should be fine. Uh, okay, fair enough. I might be moving a little bit too quick. So anyway, I was saying uh, being involved with championship events, and, and I do think that if anybody is interested in, in learning the finer details of ice making is to get involved with the championship event. If there is something in your in your, your locale or whatever is convenient for you to get involved. Don't go with any expectation that you're going to be doing anything in importance, but there's no reason why you can't look and watch and ask questions, even if you are the guy that's putting the snow in the bucket. So I owe a huge thanks to the 
folks I've worked with uh, over the years at different events, Hans Wutrich, J.B. Barassa, Dave Merklinger, Mark Schreck, and there are so many, many others that have crossed paths over the year and always an opportunity to, to learn. And of course, I would not be where I am today uh, ice making would not be where it is today, and the whole game of curling would not be where it is today without the input of Shorty Jenkins. So I had opportunities to work with Shorty Jenkins and, and, and learn from him, and he really did either invent or perfect everything that we do. And the fact that he put that effort in has changed the game, and it's changed the game for ice makers, and it's changed the game for curves in a big, big way. Just a quick comparison of the differences between hockey ice and curling ice. In the game of hockey, pretty simple concept. Dump water, driving in a circle, freeze it, drag out the hockey. Curling ice, on the other hand, needs an understanding of refrigeration, uh, the sciences of water, sciences of air, accuracy of blades, uh, various scraping patterns, what they do and how you do them, uh, blade honing, uh, pebble distribution, amounts of clipping, physics of rocks, witchcraft, much, much more. <laughs> I will say that I have no knowledge of witchcraft whatsoever. And I think one thing that is, is missing from this, and it is of great importance to all of us, is safety. So I don't know how I miss having that in there, but I certainly would say that understanding curling ice and the operations at a curling club, certainly safety is a huge component in that as well. The newspaper article from a couple of years ago. I don't know why I put it in there. I just sort of thought it was funny. If curling is landing on Mars is sort of like curling, I wonder what they would compare ice making to. <clears throat> so, concepts that ice makers are trying to achieve is, of course, a level. Everybody to keep in mind at this point that level and flat are two different words. Level is something that is achieved when water sits, but it doesn't necessarily freeze flat. So that's a different concept that we'll discuss in just a second. We're trying to make the ice fast. We're trying to make it last. We're trying to give a, a suitable curl, and we're trying for all these things to be consistent. Base level by flooding. Repeated flooding until the desired thickness and level is achieved. And thickness, level supersedes thickness every time. Uh, to achieve a flat surface, it's a repetition of pebbling and scraping and pebbling and scraping and pebbling and scraping until all the low areas in the ice are filled with pebble and all the high areas have been scraped clean. Not got a consistent surface. The rock does not have a good chance of curling. It needs to be rotating on a flat surface. So that's how we do that. To make the ice fast and last, that comes down to water quality, uh, rock quality, the choice and distribution of pebble. Um, it relies on the rocks themselves, the water, temperature control is how we manage the curl and the, and the consistency. Uh, rock conditioning plays a part in this, pebble distribution plays a part in this, and the amount that is clipped plays a part in this. I would always say that the four corner posts of making good ice, one of these elements, water quality, rock
any one of these that is impact the quality of the curling sheet. Of that, I would certainly say that water quality is the most vital role in making quality curling ice. I look at curling ice as the one product that our, our curling clubs gets to sell to our customers. That one product out of one ingredient, and that one ingredient is water. And quality plays the largest role in all of those that I just pointed out, and you can see in this picture right here the difference between treated water and untreated water. So the treated water is on the right-hand side, Don. Uh, the treated water is on the on the left hand side as we're oh, looking left at this hand picture. Side. I'm sorry, and, and untreated is on the right. How much, and you can see the clarity. And yeah. in the picture on the left side, you can see how cloudy it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. <clears throat> so every facility is different. Uh, a lot of this largely comes down to the land that it was built on. Many curling clubs across the country were given cheap land for long-term leases. A lot of times that has to do with because that land is suitable. A lot of times it's on, on poor, poor drainage, swamp area. How it was constructed, what type of materials it was made in. In the part of the country I'm in, there were an awful lot of buildings, curling clubs that were built in the in the mid 50s to mid 60s. A lot of these facilities were not designed for today's environment in mind. At that time, uh, uh, energy was cheap, and curling did not have the same the same onus or time of year. We used to curl from November through March, and now that is being pushed at both ends, and a lot of these facilities simply were not designed to do that. Uh, the local water quality uh, certainly plays a role as well. And all across the country in different places, the water quality will vary. It will vary quite, quite extreme. And that's where water treatment and, and water treatment comes into play. Of course, every facility has a different amount of available manpower, and a lot of this comes down to the budgeting and the operations of the club itself, and temperature controls. And many curling clubs cannot afford the sophisticated technology that is out there today, and that's why we have differences in various facilities that we play in. So conditions certainly do vary as well, and they vary between the arena events that we watch on TV and the club events that we get to participate in. And the conditions will change because what needs to be kept in mind is for the championship events that we all watch on TV, there is a small army of, of fairly well-trained professional ice makers looking after that, and they're looking after it on a draw-by-draw -draw basis. So Every draw is prepared, every draw is monitored, and in the curling club environment, there just isn't the manpower often for that to be achieved. Um, at a curling club, there might be one or two, maybe three guys. Maybe they've had some training, maybe they haven't. And at the big events, they have large budgets to manage all of the needs. In a curling club, often the budgets are either non-existent or not able to uh, supply all the equipment. And in a curling club, um, some of these buildings, again, are, are old. Some of the equipment is not quite up to speed. And in an in arena situation, there's also so much more available power. And that is in the refrigeration side of things and also in the air handling and dehumidification. And many of these curling clubs are, are very, very small in comparison. So what else will change 
conditions throughout the day in, in curling events is the number of draws that are being played in the course of the day, the time in between the draws, and the opportunities to scrape the ice. So without the opportunities to scrape the ice and eliminate pebble buildup, uh, the pebble will simply build up over the course of the day and the conditions will vary from draw to draw. So I do encourage anybody who is on the bond spiel organizing end of things to think about that and build some schedules in for your ice technicians to be able to, to redo a sheet of ice or, or the rink for that matter. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time. It certainly does take some organization of the manpower and having things available, but the curlers will certainly thank you for that. Um, so they have that much of a better playing condition to play on. And the other thing is temperature recovery. So we talk about the curling clubs that have smaller horsepower refrigeration capabilities. It gives the ice itself a chance to, to become back to the proper temperature. So there's a few things that I, as an ice maker, question what the curlers are doing. And I'm not going to try to spark a debate or anything, but it certainly seems to me that over the last few seasons, I don't know how many it is, the emphasis has been on the, the last shot draw and drawing for hammer. And what I see is teams utilizing their pregame pre -game ice time and instead of learning the contours of the sheets, what I'm seeing is that they are trying to develop that one path into the button. So as an ice maker, I've heard it on many, many occasions that, that the first end feels inconsistent for speed. And I kind of think that that's something that the teams themselves are doing with the emphasis on the last shot draw. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not certain what the answer to that problem is, but I am seeing it as a problem, and I'll throw it back out to you guys as, as to what can we do as ice technicians to make a consistent sheet when for seven minutes one team is going to warp it in this way and for another seven minutes the other team is going to warp in that way. I really don't see how the sheet can be consistent when, when that has just happened for 12 or 14 minutes or whatever it is. I throw that back to you guys. Don, do you want me to, Don, is that a rhetorical question, or would you like me to open up the mics for a minute? Um, well, I don't want to spark we, any great debate and use up all of our time. Okay, um, let's, keep going. let's keep okay, going. Let's keep going. Fair enough. And we'll have, okay. we'll have people save their questions and comments for later on. Perfect. Okay, excellent. The other thing that plays apart, and I think this is a, a certainly a, a problem that is across the board in curling. We just saw a very interesting <laughs> take on this at the uh, uh, Canada Cup this past weekend. I'm not certain that that's the answer either, but I do think it comes down to the pace of play. And whether we're playing in timed events or non-timed events, it's every curler's role to keep the pace of play going. I am a, a former mediocre competitive curler long before the free guard zone was introduced, but it seems to me there were still 16 rocks in an end, and 15 minutes, I think, is is adequate amount of time. I, I do understand the complexities of the game, but one thing I certainly question is the need to have a team huddle after every end. So that's something else that just kind of makes me wonder, what, what are we doing here? And equipment. There are so many, so many situations where I'm seeing very experienced curlers using equipment that has no business being out there. It's on your feet. And I think every curling facility needs to think about the routes that people are going, and that's right from the parking lot, where in Toronto we are obsessed with the use of salt. And in it comes to the curling club and down the hall to the locker room and our curling shoes go on and we walk down the carpet that is basically dripping in salt by that point. So this question is rhetorical. Have you ever washed your gripper in the kitchen sink? And if the answer is no, 
I'm curious to know, well, why not? Sorry, I was just allowing somebody in. <laughs> oh, good. These pictures are not photoshopped. The picture on the very left, that was actually at a Canadian championship. Worn by one of our national competitors. The next picture over, I don't recall where that picture was taken, but this is what happens on the inside of curling shoes. And this is why it's so important that they can actually, that that gets cleaned out. Because when you take that off, that gunk is now stuck to your sliding foot and you are going to transfer that out into the field of play. So the picture on the right is also a real picture, not photoshopped in any way. It involves a kitchen sink and some water and a scrub brush. And your grippers might be in fine shape as far as the, the texture and the grip of them. And the bottoms might get swiped and wiped with the boot boy cleaners, but I would encourage every single curler to, to take your gripper home as often as needed and clean the inside of it out. If you could do that, I would thank you. So how the game has changed over the last number of years. When my father made curling ice, and even even less, uh, was very almost crude technology. The water that was used was just wet. Out of the tap, that would do it. Uh, scrapers uh, were electric machines, and ice would be scraped and repebbled a few times per week, perhaps. Um, the temperature controls uh, back in the day did not know what time of day it was, did not know what a decimal point was. If you turn the tiny, tiny, tiny dial a sixteenth of a turn, you, you may have just changed the ice temperature by four or five degrees. It was very much a, a hit and miss sort of proposition. Um, rocks uh, that were made prior to, to the modern era were made pretty much by uh, inconsistency certainly did exist right from manufacturing. And then the dirty, bruce, abrasive ice conditions uh, affected how those rocks would, would perform over the years. If we think about the days of corn brooms and hairbrushes and, and cigarettes, uh, we had slow, maybe 18, 22 second ice. Uh, the game has changed a lot. Uh, now the water that's being used is treated all of the impurities that are in water are, are removed, and the process is either a deionization process or a reverse osmosis process. And a lot of that comes from our friends at Jet Ice, who are the pretty much the industry standard as far as uh, water purification goes. Our scrapers today are cordless, battery-operated machines, and ice is, is resurfaced multiple times a day at most facilities. The uh, controls that are available to us today are done from real time on your laptop sitting on your porch, and we can monitor temperatures to within a tenth of a degree and, and be able to do that from anywhere that the Internet will allow access to. Uh, today's rocks are made with uh, computer accuracy, CNC machines. So every rock that comes out of the shop is going to be identical to the one that came out prior. And a set of stones are going to be as matched as is absolutely possible. And I would venture that they are matched better than any human would be able to detect a difference in. And today we have fast 25 plus second ice from hog to two. And the game has, the game has changed immensely. So what I would suggest that curlers keep in mind is, is believe what you see. Um, if you are noticing something, the answer very well might be, might be yes. 
sometimes ice makers are a little bit too sensitive and are looking for a defense to what they might be perceived as a complaint. And that complaint might simply be an observation. So that's something that I think ice makers need to sort of think about is that not all complaints are something that needs to be dealt with, but what curlers I think need to be aware of is that not every sheet of ice is going to be ideal. So believe what you see. If you are perceiving a, a straight spots or a fall in the ice, sometimes the answer simply is yes, that is what's there and put the broom accordingly. So my father taught me to, to play the sheet I was on, not the sheet I wanted to be on. And I think he actually stole that from a, from a golf legend, but I'm not certain. So the problems that do affect ice makers that, that lead to some of the difficulties uh, for us and for you is, uh, for starters, drafty buildings. And a lot can be done with cans of spray foam, um, but a lot of places simply haven't, haven't done that yet and the doors are blowing air in, and what that leads to is sublimation. So sublimation is when a, a solid goes to a, a vapor state without passing through the liquid state. So you could kind of akin that to putting an ice cube tray in the freezer and not looking at it for the next three months. And I would venture when you go to take that ice cube tray out, there's, there's nothing there. And that's what sublimation is. So it went from ice to air. It never went through the liquid stage. And that's what a draft in a building does for you. Um, inadequate air handling, uh, heat and dehumidification, and that leads to frost. And frost is something that will occur in a curling club and during an event. And it is something that, that players must sort of try to deal with the best they can. The ice maker's job is to deal with the the humidity levels and anticipate that frost will come and make their selection of pebbling sizes and distribution to, to, to make that sheet as playable as it can. The reality is when it is game time, the ice maker has now done everything that they can do and we hand it over to the curse. So sometimes frost will be an issue, and it's something that the uh, the players will simply have to pick up on. And part of that is to consciously play the whole sheet. If half a sheet does not get played for an end or two, it will collect frost, and the speed will certainly be different. Um, picks is something that happens when pedal breaks down. Picks is something that happens also from dirty equipment and and debris in the ring, but it is is something that certainly does affect our game. So weather conditions are something that are ice maker problems, uh, and every building handles weather conditions a little bit better or worse than others. Um, the, the size of refrigeration certainly plays a role in this, and the accuracy of our blades. Um, when blades do get somewhat out of whack, if I could say that, it is certainly not something that we can see with our naked eye, but certainly can lead to putting runs and falls into the curling ice. Um, the size of refrigeration, whether it is too much or not enough, often is what breaks, breaks into pebble breakdown and the fudge factor. And of course, pace of play, once again, I will mention. So, my first slide mentioned ice. ice. So, in theory, we have a perfect world going. In reality, uh, some days are not quite as perfect. And the blades that we use come out of their grinding, sharpening shops. They are ground to an accuracy across five feet of about half the thickness of a human hair. And that's something we certainly can't see or manage with our own eyes. So in reality, it is quite a skilled adventure to learn how to hone a blade accurately so that we can maintain the accuracy required um, on the blade. Uh, rocks are manufactured, again, through CNC machinery. 
Um, they will come out with an exact running surface dimension of 5.8 millimeters. And in reality, as rocks age, um, we texture them and that's sanding stones. And we do that by hand and we do it as required. Uh, new rocks have perfect profiled striking bands and the rocks that are in curling clubs often are, are not brand new and therefore the striking bands have become flat over time and that affects the angles and the uh, trajectories when we play hit and rolls. In a perfect world, um, we use uh, water purification processes and there, there are several of them and they are, the water is cleaned to zero parts per million. Um, that is kind of a rare thing and in a curling club environment water systems that we are using to clean the water do become exhausted over time so it comes comes down to uh, budget and replacement and availability and leads to more impurities in the surface which affects the pebble affects the pebble bonding uh, affects the speed many many things and in a perfect world, our temperatures are managed to a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit. And again, many curling clubs simply do not have that technology yet. I think we're making big improvements in getting technology into most curling clubs, but it's still not necessarily part of today's reality. John, um, I just have a question. Um, I was in Omaha last week for the Curling World Cup, the the second leg yes. of the new competition. <clears throat> and um, the Ralston Arena where the competition was held, it was a beautiful arena. But one thing that I noticed that the ice maker was doing was every time they scraped, they would take, uh, they would clean the, the snow off the scraper, put it in a dustpan, and then they would weigh it. Yes. I thought that was, I've never seen that done before. Maybe I'm not observant enough, but I thought that was very interesting. That's an excellent question that you have. And, and what, they are, what they are measuring is the amount that they have clipped off. Okay. So the ice is first prepared. Uh, uh, all the pebble is removed. Uh, the new pebble, you know, usually there's two two layers of pebble, a base pebble and a top pebble. Then they will take the scraper and put the blade to almost a minimal setting. They're, what they're doing is just getting pinheads. They're just getting the very tops of the pebble. In a curling mm -hmm. club, what you see commonly are nippers, which is a small device that is pushed up and pushed back. It carries very small, four very small lightweight blades that float on the surface. I'm assuming what you guys were watching was using their full machine. Yes. And then it's important that we know how much was clipped off of the surface. And that's right. measured game by game. And it's, again, the goal here is consistency. So wow. they would put that on a digital scale yep. and get an exact instantaneous answer as to how much was clipped off. And that does wow. usually vary due, through the course of the <clears throat> event. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when I worked with Mr. Jenkins, he would, uh, again, technology comes a long way. We didn't know then that you could just stick it on a scale. Um, we would put it in a, in, a, in, a, in a cup and run to the other end of the building and hip somebody out of the way in front of a microwave, melt it, and then put it in a measuring cup. So wow. today's... <laughs> how it took so long for somebody to figure out you could just stick it on a scale and get an instant answer, I don't know. But that is what we do today. Wow. Exacting. It is very much an exacting science yep. that goes into this. Awesome. So why do we do stuff to begin with? So why do we pebble? The whole concept of pebble is to provide the correct contact area between the ice and the rock. So the contact area, of course, is the ice and the top of the pebbles and the running surface of the stone. So that's the small band on the stone that is actually in contact with the ice. If that contact area is not correct, 
one of two things is going to happen. The pebble will break down until the correct contact area is found, or the ice will be heavy and lead to picks uh, because it is too flat to begin with. So what else pebble does is it provides a place in between the pebbles for debris to go. And there will always be debris. Any curling club or curling event that thinks they are exempt from airborne debris is, is delusional. There's always going to be stuff in the air. A lot of it comes from our clothing. Fleece should be banned, by the way. Um, and a lot of it is our own human DNA, skip scratching their heads, in hair. Um, there's always going to be some dust particles in the air. And in some of these arena events, we need to keep in mind that some of these buildings are old and there's a lot of rafters up there and there's always an opportunity for airborne debris to be coming down. What Pebble does is it gives a place for that to go. If we didn't have Pebble, then that stuff would land on the ice and the rock would simply mash it in and it, the game would be, it just wouldn't work. So the Pebble itself needs to be the correct size and temperature for the proper contact area to be achieved. So pebbling heads are uh, usually are copper. They have very, very tiny holes in them, but those holes are different from pebbling head to pebbling head. So in size of pebble, it, it's which size of hole, and then the pebble needs to be distributed evenly from end to end and from side to side. And to tell you the truth, pebbling is probably the one aspect that is most culpable for poor ice conditions. Uh, pebbling is the one thing that we do manually. Pretty well everything else that we do has some sort of control over it. What, what we can only control what our own hands and feet are able to do, and some people simply should not pebble. That doesn't mean that they can't be helpful. That doesn't mean that they can't be great ice technicians, but some people just physically can't do that. So it's kind of important there. Uh, why do we scrape? Uh, we scrape to remove the previous pebble. If we did not remove the previous pebble, game by game by game, we would see slower and slower ice conditions. So that is removed to bring us back down to our flat and level surface and keep the pebble that we have put on removed and reapplied for the next game. Uh, because the pebble provides a place for debris to go, when we remove that pebble and the rocks have not ground that stuff into the ice, the blade is easily able to pick that up and we take that away with all the snow that we make. So we scrape to maintain the speed and we scrape to maintain the correct or correct the, the shape of the sheet. And we are looking for the shape of a sheet in profile. Um, ice makers must gain some a semblance of what the shape of the sheep is, very much the same as skipping. Um, and then we will try to do either corrective or maintenance with the uh, scraper to maintain consistency. <coughs> Stuck, there we go. Okay, so why do we texture? And texture is uh, the fancy word for sanding. Um, this is not something that's new. This is something that has been going on for many, many, many years. However, it's only been in the last several years that it has come out. Sanding rocks or texturing rocks is something that, that was done in the middle of the night when nobody was there and nobody knew about it. And it's very much become open, and it is part of the routine of ice making today. So in the reality world, what happens with ice and rock, because we are using such clean, clean water, as opposed to the uh, impurities of yesterday, is that the ice actually polishes the rock. As the rock spends its time going up and down the ice, it is getting smoother and smoother and smoother. What else is happening with the rocks, and it's the same as, as the grippers and as the broom heads, is the rocks themselves do get grunged up. Even though we use clean water and scrape often, there are still impurities in there that do come out. 
and the scratches or texture in the rock do get filled with with grunge from time to time. So part of the process of texturing is to actually clean the rock and it adds surface roughness uh, or, or traction, grip if you will, uh, which allow the rock to bite the pebble and provide the curl. It's done with a proper selection of sandpaper, the type of paper and the grit of paper, and each rock must be done exactly the same with a new piece of paper for each and every rock. And I don't just suggest that, it's absolutely imperative that a new piece of paper for each and every curling stone is used. There is an excellent uh, video on YouTube, and I didn't know how to put a link in here or if it would work, but it's called Discover Curling, Rock Maintenance, and that's with Fred Veal from Canada Curling Stone. So if you folks want to get a quick little seven or eight minute video on the concept of texturing stones, uh, YouTube and search for Discover Curling. I believe it's on Curling Canada's uh, YouTube channel. So before any of this is done, we must know what the width of the running surface is so that the correct process can be used in, in taking us towards better. Um, at many courses, et cetera, I've emphasized this, that if, if you don't know where you are, how are you going to get to where you want to be? And there are different processes uh, correcting or addressing the width of the running surface. And it is very typical that the rocks used for championship events are textured just prior to the arena event and quite possibly partway through the event as well. And that speaks to the duration of the event. Some of the events are, are shorter duration. They start on Tuesday night. They're over on Sunday. Other events start on effectively Thursday night, and they go for a week and a half. So there's sort of a consideration there that takes, it takes into place. And, yes, you will know. When that happens, you will know. You will see a difference in how the rocks are performing. Recently textured stones do require more rotation, do require more ice, do require an outward release. Textured rocks will break sooner, and the sweepers must be anticipating that. The difference there is that if it, sweepers are waiting to see that the rock is breaking or curling, then they will not be able to, to make that shot because they weren't anticipating. So this is a funny picture that a ice making friend of mine sent to me a couple of years ago. And he found this up on the carpet in the curling rink one morning with a nice little note on it that says, this rock is bad, he's changing turns. And I think <laughs> that might speak to the fact that maybe we need a little bit more rotation. Now, the bad part of this is, this ice maker fellow had a six sheet event happening that morning and 95 of his rocks were still on the ice and this rock sat up on the carpet all night long and was considerably warmer than the rest. So that's something to keep in mind. Please don't leave the carpet rocks up on the carpet for your ice maker to find. All granite used for curling rocks comes from either Scotland or Wales. And even though uh, earth is, is largely made of material, the granite from Scotland or Wales, two locations, is the only granite that's been found without the presence of quartz. And Curling rocks that would have quartz in them, that quartz is very much looks like glass. If you look at your own uh, kitchen countertops or whatnot, and there's little sparkly bits in there, it kind of looks like glass. So that glass-like substance, quartz, would not handle the abuse of rocks hitting into each other. So it's a very rare variety of granite that is without quartz. And those are found in two places. The uh, island of Elsa Craig is just off the coast of Scotland. 
and the Trevor Mountain is uh, a mountain in Wales. And those are the two places that they've found granite that does not have quartz in it. The Blue Home Elsa Craig is a very, very finely grained, very dense granite. It has the best running surface, but it is not the best striking surface because of the density of it. When they do hit over years and years and years, the striking bands tend to deteriorate. And because it is such a dense material, uh, they're not suitable for for uh, uh, reconditioning. So it's usually used for the insert material in a Trevor casing. So Trevor is a mountain in Wales. It's a much coarser grained. It's a relatively softer granite, and it provides the best striking surface. So uh, uh, insert stone that is made with uh, Blue Hone Elsa Craig in a Trevor casing is the best of both worlds. You've got the best for running surface, and you have the best for striking surface. So there are two places on earth that produce curling stones. Uh, one is Canada Curling Stone just outside of London, and the other is Kays of Scotland, which is just not far from the island of Elsa Craig. Uh, these mountains are massive, and the world of curling will not run out of granite anytime soon. We have more than enough for a lifetime supply. And the big question is, what is the difference between arena rocks and club rocks? And the answer is zero, absolutely none. Rocks that are come out of production are 100% the same as rocks for arena events versus for curling clubs. There's no difference to them whatsoever. The difference is how often they are used. Uh, a few events per season or versus every day in a curling club. So every day in a curling club means that striking bands are hitting that much more often, rocks are traveling that much more, and, and as far as production goes, the running surface width is made exactly the same at the uh, places that produce curling stones. What is different is that the arena rocks are typically conditioned or textured uh, to provide lots of curl and more curl than most curling clubs would want for regular club play. And again, every club may be different in that one. Differences between arena ice and club ice. Well, this is a tough one to talk about, and it, it all depends about where we are talking about. I live in, in a very large city, city of Toronto. We have lots of curling facilities. Each facility has employed ice technicians and, and staff. Not always the case in the rural areas. Many curling clubs operate on a volunteer basis. They certainly can have fantastic ice, but often this, the volunteer base doesn't have the working experience or the manpower to achieve this. And I'm, I'm 34 years into ice making and I'm still kind of scratching my head about the differences and how that ice making uh, help my curling game. So at an arena event that uh, is prepared every single draw, again, there's a small army that is, is available to do that. Pebble before it's scraped reduces any frost, fills in any low areas from previous scraping or airflow issues, etc. All the pebble is removed, reapplied, and clipped just prior to game time. Temperatures are monitored constantly and adjustments made through a game to maintain proper ice temperatures. Um, curling club ice is prepared, rarely is it prepared every drop. It typically is uh, uh, somebody's role first thing in the morning to prepare it for the day, and then draw changes following that. So again, to bond spiel organizers, if you can schedule time in for uh, some scraping and repebbling, the curlers certainly will thank you for that. And the arena ice is brand new. It's like three days old. Um, curling club ice could be in for weeks, could be in for months. 
has seen way, way, way many more games. And so because it's seen so many more games, and again, it could be a few weeks old or a few months old, the ice is, is harder and it is denser. And as rocks run over pebble, a certain amount of that pebble gets mashed into the surface and it makes the pebble harder and denser and more difficult to remove. Uh, arena ice is brand new. It's in a much softer state. Uh, pebble is removed for every game. The pebble buildup does not occur so much. Uh, other differences, the arena sheets are flooded individually. Now, I'm not certain, Andrea, where everybody is from, but I am in, in Ontario, and it's very rare for clubs in Ontario to have dividers between their sheets of ice. So at most clubs, whether it be six-sheet club or four-sheet club, we are flooding all the sheets together, and that is different than what happens in an arena. In an arena, and would be the same in the western provinces, flood each sheet individually. So because of that, our scraping patterns are somewhat different. Uh, in an arena event, the sheet has is, is got a foam perimeter, and obviously the blade cannot overlap that foam perimeter. And that foam perimeter also can force the water to expand differently as it's freezing. If you think about your ice cube tray, when you put it in and it stops sloshing around, everything is going to be perfectly level. But once it freezes, because of the dividers in your in your ice cube tray, it causes an expansion in the middle. And that same thing would apply in a curling club uh, with dividers and also a curling club without dividers, just at a much lesser extent. So in a curling club, we can overlap our dividing lines, and that's something that cannot be done in the, uh, in the arena event. And advantages to that is without dividers, when we finish scraping the ice, we have one pile of snow to clean up not six or four or eight individual ones. So things that you can look for as players, as coaches, you have a chance to see what the ice is following a draw and see how well that pebble held up. That certainly might prepare you for your draw. And if you do this when the game is completed, you'll see what it looks like after eight ends or 10 ends, and watch the scraping process. Sometimes this is not done when curlers are there to see, but if it does, certainly pay attention. And watch the pebbling process. And you can actually use your stopwatch uh, to get a feel for consistency. And I'm not suggesting actual numbers here, but if the pebbling is taking less than 30 seconds, I think that might be too fast. If it's taking more than 60 seconds, that might be too slow. But I've got to say maybe, because maybe the guy at that facility has got it figured out that that's what works best for him. So I'm in no position to say that that is, it is right or wrong. That decision is made, is a trial and error process, is not something that's going to happen in somebody's first week or maybe even in the first season of working at the current club. It's suited to the rocks and the conditions in that facility. And the environmental conditions might also dictate so my memory goes back to a, a frosty Thursday in St. Catharines at the Scott Tournament of Hearts, where we had some dehumidification problems and we had to make adjustments to our ice making routines based on the conditions to try to give the curlers the best conditions possible. I was there, we scraped the ice halfway through every game that particular day. It was not a great day, but we did the best we could of that. And I learned on that day that Dave Merkweger suffers from Tourette's. I found that out very first thing in the morning. When the ice is prepared properly, pebbles should look like individual drops of water on a glass or a flat surface. So you can just look at the bubbles that are in this presentation and, and see that they're individual bubbles. We don't want them joining together. There should be about six to nine individual pebbles in a one inch by one inch area. And again, that might vary and somewhere in that ballpark. So it's the size of the holes in the pebbling head that dictates the speed going down the ice. So the bigger the holes, the faster the ice technician must go from one end to the other 
so that they land separate and they have a chance to freeze before they join together. And of course, the obvious is true as well. The, the tinier the holes, the slower the ice technician can go. And I mean from one end to the other. I'm not referring to hand speed. Easy. Just being lazy. <laughs> That's just two guys having fun in Knoxville, Tennessee in June. <laughs> I'll just move right along. So also, what, what you can watch for also, if you have a chance to watch the ice makers or the ice, what we're watching for is the snow accumulation being even across the blade. The blades are typically five feet long, and they should build pebble or should build snow evenly across. If the snow is not being formed evenly, that could speak to a number of things. That could mean that the blade itself is out of out of straight. It could mean that there are either high spots or low spots in the ice itself. Or it could mean that where the blade is overlapping from the previous path, the pebble there has already been removed, therefore it will not build up as equally on the, on the blade itself. So part of ice making is being aware of the shape of the sheet and knowing or perceiving where the high spots are and the low spots are. Uh, high spots could be caused from pebble buildup. Low spots could be caused from drafts or air handling systems. But the ice technician needs to be aware of these things and pick the proper scraping pattern to bring it back towards better. Um, and a scrape sheet should have the same texture right across the entire sheet from side to side, end to end, Either, you know, 100% of the pebble has been removed or 90% or whatever, but it should be consistent right across the entire sheet of ice. Oh, I'm sorry. That was the wrong picture. I meant to, <laughs> I meant to show you that picture is the one I did. We talk about the consistency of the snow across the blade. These pictures, I think, are a perfect indication of what that is and this guy over here i'm not sure what he's doing but obviously he's doing what he does <laughs> so anyway going back to the guy that you just watched pebble at the curling club so if we're going too slow or if we're going too fast what happens is the drops of water land too close together and before they have a chance to freeze they actually join together. And that's a property of water. The water likes itself, it wants to stay together. And if you try with an eyedropper on a flat or a glass table, to put drops close to each other, you will see exactly what I'm referring to. Too close together, they'll suck themselves together and make one big blobby pebble. <clears throat> what we want is for them to land with some space in between and they have a chance to freeze individually. Again, so we have space between the pebble. Or I turn you guys into arm check, armchair ice technicians. There are a hundred decisions that are made that might, maybe not, that maybe affect your game. And those decisions were made hours ago. There is no secret buttons that we can push that are instantly going to change an ice surface temperature. These things take hours to sort themselves out. And I'd also like to recognize that, that these are not affecting the outcome of your game. These might be affecting the day in general, but both teams play on the same sheet. One team figures out how to win and the other team figures out how to lose. I don't know any ice technicians that are trying to make a bad sheet of ice or trying to affect any one team. Ice technicians don't know how to do that. Um, and the decisions that they did make that affect the outcome were made many, many hours ago. Sometimes they were made last night, sometimes six hours ago, but again, there's no magic switch that we have. And sometimes the issues uh, that lead to poor conditions are something that's just not gonna happen today. It might be that uh, the dehumidifier 
uh, the, the belts that are required uh, won't be until Wednesday. So that's something as curlers that we simply have to get around as well, that perfect conditions are not always something that we can strive for. So something you can look for, uh, just a thought, but it might be the tip jar for the ice crew. And that might be the difference at a lot of curling clubs that have trouble uh, retaining ice technicians. There's a lot of ice technicians that work as, as volunteers. There's a lot of ice technicians that get uh, steered into other industries because they can maybe earn more money or perhaps have less stress and pressure. And it's something that, that we all do as curlers is we support our bartenders with tips each time they open a beer bottle for us. Um, and this might have a huge impact on the game of curling if it's just something that we could think about going forward. And I would like to uh, thank everybody for your time. I'm looking forward to hearing what your feedback are, is, and uh, I'm open for any questions you may have. That's great, Dawn. And I never even thought of the tip jar for the ice maker. Um, our club is currently operating with volunteer, well, or very underpaid ice makers. So that is a that's a a, a really interesting thought. I do appreciate you bringing that up. We have a couple of comments that go back to um, your uh, observation about teams and the last shot draw and throwing everything down one side towards the center. So yes. one of the one of the observations is maybe it's time to shorten the warm up to four or five minutes. Another one was yes. uh, throw the last shot draw after two practice shots, then complete the seven minutes for practice. So that's kind of an interesting concept. I know yes. in um, I know in Omaha what they did was they allowed um, they, there was no last shot draw. It was an evenly split draw. So everybody got <clears throat> three last rocks and three not last rocks. So that was very helpful. You know, so that's another idea. Go back to spreading the last shot advantage in the first end out evenly. Uh, yes. We have, we have a couple of questions. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the mic. Um, before we do that, are sticky mats um, effective at removing debris before it gets on the ice surface? Um, yes, yes and no. Okay. And it's evident when the first few people walk across it that uh, even the cleanest curling shoes tend to leave a footprint behind. So answer to that is, is yes, however, uh, for them to be effective, they need to be changed regularly. Um, there almost needs to be somebody there to, to peel off the next one. And in my experience at curling clubs, to, to be particular, is that when sticky mats are used, people tend to have the assumption that because they walked on the sticky mat, there that can't be anything on my shoe. Right. Well, if you walked in front of me and the popcorn that was on your shoe is now stuck on the sticky mat and then I walk on it, is there not an opportunity for that popcorn to now be on my shoe? So it still gets out there. What I encourage teams to do as, as much as possible, and I know this is not always a suitable answer, but carry something that you can wear in the curling club, like a pair of slippers, for example, so that you can take your outdoor footwear off, put something on you can wear around the curling club, and literally carry your shoes to the ice surface. And then if you get into them there, you've got every chance to look at the bottom of your shoes, and now you know that you're not walking through a, a carpet that's saturated in salt, for example. Good suggestion. Very good suggestion. I have another question. Um, in the chat box, anyone other than Keys and Canada Curling Stones that ma manufacture the Blue Hone, Hone Trevor Stones? 
Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, there was a company started in China a few years ago, but I honestly don't have any knowledge as to what type of granite or where they were getting granite from. And I also don't know if that company is still in existence. So okay. to my knowledge, there are only the two manufacturers of pearling stones. Okay. Another question. We see lots of professional teams still trying to get a stone to curl by sweeping one side or the other. Do you think the new approved fabric still has a scratching effect that could influence the direction of the stone? I, I certainly do. Oh, okay. Interesting. And again, I, I believe what I see. Mm -hmm. And we're still seeing it at the elite level. And I think the guys who, the guys and girls who are, who are playing at the elite level have a much better perspective than I do. And the fact that they are still doing it uh, tells me that there must be something to it. As an ice technician, the, the new and improved, I uh, approved, I could say, uh, material, I'm not certain what it's called, certainly is having a less detrimental effect on the pebble itself. Now, I was uh, somewhat involved during the season of, uh, of Everything Goes, mm -hmm. and the effects to the ice were dramatic. So I applaud everybody that made something happen in that regard. But the fact that the top teams are still trying to influence the stone must mean that there is something to that. It might not be to the same effect, but I certainly do think that there is something something behind that one. So we still could be making micro scratches. It's not just polishing anymore. Uh, I haven't seen... Uh, the new conforming brooms being able to do anything that I would say is detrimental to the ice surface. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, a question, how can we tweak the ice at a championship event to create more curl? How can you tweak the ice at a championship event to create more curl? <laughs> As an ice technician? Yes. Okay. There's There's... A number of things that might lead to more curl. Uh, the first one you alluded to with your question about why they were weighing the snow. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of clip is, is something that does affect the contact area. Uh, the more contact area, and again, I'm referring to the, the running surface of the rock and the tips of the pebble, which in a clipped environment are actually clipped pretty flat if you can picture a, a, a plateau versus a volcano. Um, the, the more that is clipped does lead to having more curl. So in a championship event, it is quite normal for the rocks to be textured just before the event begins. The opening practices and the first draw, the amount of clip might be almost invisible. Game by game, that amount of clip might gradually be increased to allow, as the rocks polish off, that contact area to remain the same and for consistency to, to be uh, available through the entire event. Once that amount reaches a certain amount, now we're clipping off too much and we're compromising that the pebble can get through the duration of the game. So before that point is achieved, typically that's when the rock will get textured again during the event, and they will then go back to clipping next to invisible. So by the time we get to our championship final on the weekend, um, they're, they're clipping an amount that's giving the contract area to allow for the good curl, but without compromising the pebble so much that it's gone flat in the, in the sixth event. Interesting. Very interesting. That's probably the biggest thing I would say is 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 going to influence the amount of curl. Um, having said that, temperatures as well. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, usually the warmer the temperature of the ice itself, um, the faster the ice can be and possibly more curl can be achieved. However, there's a, there's a point to that, that ice is slipperier, the warmer it is. And at a certain point, we're compromising the safety of the people that are on the ice. Yeah. We can go so far with that one. Okay. Uh, fifth end break. What is the main cause of faster ice in the end after the break? Is it <coughs> primarily due to the cooler ice surface temperature? Um, yes. And also, at many of the events, the ice is mopped. Uh, either around once or sometimes several times during the fifth end break. And that mop is actually being used to to remove any moisture that might be sitting on the ice surface, any vapor that's close to the ice surface that normally if the ice sat dormant, it would turn into frost and it would be marginally slower. Mm -hmm. But, But yes, and the ice has had a chance to recover its temperature. Okay. What is the greatest indicator that rocks need to be sharpened? Lack of curl. Okay. Now we go back to, uh, we need to know what the correct width is. Mm -hmm. Uh, We need to know what the ideal width is. And the ideal width is somewhere between five and a half to six millimeters wide. Once we start getting above, say, seven millimeters, eight millimeters, that's starting to get into a fairly wide rock. Um, A wide rock will often be faster, uh, but will also be much straighter. And for some reason, uh, texturing does not last as long. So that's what we would sort of consider a, a wide running surface. When we get below, say, four and a half or five millimeters, uh, that rock is considered a sharp rock. That rock will traditionally be heavier, will start curling sooner, and a telltale time of a, of a, of a skinny running surface is the fact that it's accumulated snow as it traveled down the ice. So that snow was the tips of the pebbles, and there's not enough pebble distribution or pebble size to support that rock. So that rock is going to grind the pebble down until it finds the correct contact area. So really to answer your question is is lack of curl. And that's something that's becoming more and more the normal part of ice making maintenance is the texture of the stone. Uh, Going back, you know, five, 10 years ago, something that some clubs did and some clubs didn't and it was pretty obvious which clubs did and which clubs didn't so i'm happy to say that most curling clubs are now on board with the concept of texturing and most guys are really taking a concerted effort on how to do this correctly super what information about ice and rocks should or shouldn't be given to athletes and coaches before a competition? <clears throat> what shouldn't and shouldn't be? Yes. I, I, I don't know if I have an answer for what shouldn't be. Um, I think what should be is, is what set of rocks are being used. Mm-hmm. Now, that knowledge is only going to benefit the teams that might have had an opportunity to use those rocks in a previous event. Um, and then they can go back to their notes from that event and see if there are any peculiarities that came up with the rocks then. Now, having said that, at a championship event, those rocks are probably going to be textured before that event begins. However, Uh, The rocks do have, if a rock has a certain personality to it, let me say, I do believe that that rock is going to have that personality, even though it's been textured. And I would also say that the the rocks are going to be most evenly matched just after the texturing has happened. Now, let me clarify that. If I say just after, the first game might be a little wonky. 
and the second game might be a little bit better. And the reason why at a lot of these championship events, the ice technicians will drag the rocks up and down the ice is because they have just been recently textured and the ice technicians are trying to take that initial nuttiness away so that the rocks are going to be very evenly matched. As time goes by, uh, such as in a curling club environment, or maybe four months have gone by between texture, as those rocks are thrown and travel up and down the ice, they will polish off at slightly different rates. Uh, given some rocks are thrown more often than others, some are thrown more than others, and that's when those personalities will start to show up again. But they will be at their most consistent shortly after the texturing technique takes place. Okay. Um, at what point of condition of sliding surface of rocks should they be considered unplayable and need to be resurfaced? So is there a point where a nice technician or a club or a competition would say, no, we can't play with these rocks. They need to be reconditioned. Have you ever had that experience? I, I have had the experience of, of curling clubs who have put their hand forward to host a championship event. And there has been occasions where those rocks were not deemed in, in, in suitable championship condition. And for whatever the reason, maybe it was not within the club's resources to do something about that. And for that event, another set of rocks that was already known was brought in for the event. Okay. I can think of a couple of examples, not a lot. That, that has happened. Okay. Um, I'm not another, sure if that answered your question, though. Yeah, I think it did. I think it did. Uh, another participant in the webinar likes the idea about the tip jar, and he's going to put a put a jar out for tomorrow. So I'm going to un I'm going to unmute everyone. So if there's any uh, background noise, if you could either mute yourself if you don't wish to ask a question, or um, just uh, try to keep the background noise to a minimum. We've had a situation where one time somebody was doing their dishes and they left the, the their laptop up and all we could hear was dishes. Tell your dog to shut up, too. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No, actually, actually, I say hi to your dog. Okay. So here's, a, here's an observation from Omaha again, because it was the first time that I've experienced this, and I found it quite interesting. Um, and I'm waiting to see what the feedback is from other teams. But in Omaha, it was four minutes per end per team for the first four ends, and then four minutes and 15 seconds per end per team for the last four ends, eight end games. It was a five minute break at the, you know, after the fourth end, and one minute between ends. So if the team was on the ball and finished their scrum early, they could actually get ready to throw their rock on the, the between end break time. I thought it was very interesting. It made teams very decisive and it really fed up the game. I really liked it. Now in Canada Cup, I know they did the same thing, but they added all these timeouts. I think that it would be excellent. And, and I didn't like the fact that we didn't have timeouts, but, but the rest of it was great. I thought it was really interesting. So it, it really did speed up the game and probably made the ice makers very happy. That's just my observation. Are there any oh, questions definitely. or comments from anybody else on the call at the moment? Now's your chance. Benoit. Yes. What have you got for us? Well, I did ask my question earlier on about the Treffer and Blue Hone. That came, my answer came up. 
Okay. Is there, is our, our, I mean, our club is looking into buying new rocks. Is there any other combination of granite that we should be looking at for our rocks, other than this blue hone underneath and the rest of the rock in Treffer? Uh, yes, absolutely there is. Um, and the answer to that question is what Kay's bond spiel produces is mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a body or a casing that is yep. made out of uh, a granite that comes from the island of Elsa Craig, but it's not blue home. So it's usually called common Elsa or common green. And they will put a blue home uh, insert in that. So to answer your question, there's actually the, the two possibilities of an inserted stone, and one would be the Trevor casing, and one would be the common Elsa casing. Um, the other option is that Canada Curling Stone does produce um, curling stones that are made 100% Trevor, so they don't have an insert in them at all. And uh, to think about what would be the best option from your club, I would suggest that you contact uh, both Canada Curling Stone and Kays of Scotland to make your decision um, going forward. And, I mean, obviously, there's a question of price and other, uh, how long they last. But you as a nice man, which rocks are you hoping to find in your club? Uh, I would be hoping... That's, that is an excellent question. As an ice maker, I would be hoping to find a, a blue hone insert in a, in a Trevor casing. Uh, I would also hope that they have been uh, relatively recently reconditioned as far as a striking band goes. And mm -hmm. I would hope for as close to the maximum weight as as per our rule book, which I believe is 44 pounds with handle, I think. Yeah, it is. I could be wrong yeah. on that. It's okay. 44 for sure. I don't know with without handle. I presume with, but it's 44. Uh, I think with. And just yeah. to comment on that, I was involved with a men's provincial championship a few years ago, and a set of rocks came produced, uh, brand new stones produced by Canada Curling Stone, uh, came for that event and they were at the maximum weight allowance. So they were 44 pounds with handle. And again, I'm not certain if that's correct, but they were so fast. It was crazy at how many sweeping calls were missed where I'm watching the top teams in the province and they're awfully good at, at judging weight and when they would yell top eight, the rock would slide to the back 12. And I saw that over and over and over again. So there's something about the mass of the stone having more momentum going forward that makes well, them crazy fast. Maybe for other people that would, you know, in some future have to buy rocks. Our club, one of the factors we have to buy rocks, new rocks, is the fact they've been grinded a couple of times and we've now reached the minimal weight that a regulatory rock would have. So we can't grind them anymore. And uh, yeah. so if we bought, if a club will buy new rocks out of the maximum weight, well, they can get them grinded a couple of times before they have to buy new ones. So Absolutely. that might be on that page. Now, yeah. keep this in mind also. Um, if your rocks are becoming below weight, that certainly does not mean that they don't have any value. Um, there are a lot of uh, curling clubs that are starting up in the United States, and not just in the United States, but, but newer curling clubs that just aren't that active. And because they're fairly new, uh, they would probably offer a, a reasonable dollar for rocks that are you know, technically underweight. Experienced rocks. Experienced rocks, yeah. yes. Oh, and yeah, ours are blue hones, so they're they're good rocks. Except they 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 need a makeover, that's for sure. Okay. Don't we all? And what Canada what Canada Curling Stone does with a, a solid blue hone rock is there's some value there as well because what they will do with it is they'll they'll core it out 
make one decorative flower pot and make probably, I'm going to venture five or six pieces of insert material that they would then put into the casing of another rock. So there's, there's an avenue for you as well. There'd be some trade in value involved. Yes, we're exactly we're how aware much I don't, I don't. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions from the crowd? Uh, here is Mike, uh, if I may. Yes, absolutely, Mike. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I have a couple of questions uh, uh, to clarify one of them, mm -hmm. one of my questions about coaches and mm -hmm. IT technicians relations. I was working a couple of times at the World Championship with uh, uh, Mark McClinger and Jamie Barras, as well as Continental Cup. And every time we have, well, we were told, uh, do not reveal any information about ICE to any approaching athletes or coaches. Um, uh, and I was approached and asked some questions about how recently was uh, rock sharpened, uh, you know, stuff like that. So I was wondering, is there any, any official policy about that? Remember all the, it, there's like some, so, <laughs> okay, Benoit, hang on just a second, please, so that Don can answer Michael's question. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, and I, I'm sorry I didn't hear the end of, of your question. My, my question was I was approached by athletes and the coaches from some of the team with questions about ice conditions and rug conditions. Yes. And I didn't know if I... If if I can answer that, if uh, any inf inside information can give advantage to any of teams, I <clears throat> having been part of of many many different ice crews, I would think that the correct position would be to defer those questions to the head ice technician. Or if the head ice technician has, has specifically asked that his crew does not involve that information, then I would certainly respect his wishes on that. I know at many curling clubs, when the ice, when the rocks are textured, there is a notice given to, to the membership so that they can anticipate this. But I also know that many of the championship events, the players are not necessarily notified of this. We are assuming that, that the curlers are there of a, a capable enough caliber that they are going to recognize that when the first practice rock goes down the ice. So to answer your question, I think I would, I would defer to the wishes of whoever the head ice technician is. Um, so, does that answer your question? Yes, uh, okay, thank you. Second question, if we can. Uh, one of the set of rocks in my club have a three millimeters uh, uh, sliding band and they're extremely slow. Is there yes. anything I can do at the, my location at the club level or should I send them to Kimberly to Granite, uh, Canada Stone? You certainly can do something at your at your level. Um, there is a process for texturing rocks that will widen the striking band, or not the striking band, the running surface. So that process is rotating it on a on a on a, on a flat surface. So the surface that we typically use is a two or two and a half inch piece of, uh, of granite plate and uh, sandpaper is, is adhered to the granite plate and the rock is rotated and it's rotated many, many, many times. Um, but as you rotate the rock on a flat surface, you will be widening the running surface itself. Okay. So thanks. if a sheet, okay. We have a, a call. can we let Scott Arnold in here? Scott is with the WCF, and he has some insight into situations at the at WCF competition. So, Scott, would you like to take it away, please? <laughs> take it away. 
Sure, Andrea. Um, I mean, <laughs> add your two cents worth. Yeah, okay. We actually have a written policy at the World Curling Federation oh. about what happens to stones during a competition. Um, any maintenance that's done before an event uh, is through the recommendation of the ice tech and the chief umpire. They test the stones before an event starts. And we, um, we will tell the athletes and the coaches before the event if that's been done. Uh, if anything is done, needs to be done during the event, so if we find this going to be running too, too straight, then we have to actually, it has to be two days in advance of the end of round robin, we can then um, maintain the snow, but it can't be done after that. So in, in a world championship, it's midweek, so Wednesday, Thursday, that would be the last days that we'd be allowed to, uh, or Tuesday, Wednesday, sorry, we'd be allowed to um, maintain the snow. And we always tell everybody, so an email is sent out to all the coaches and teams if that, that maintenance is going to be done. So it's always it's always told to everybody. That, that's, I would that's, agree with that. Yeah, that's interesting. Because when I was at the Scotties last year in Penticton, Dave Merklinger was the chief ice maker. And uh, towards the end of the week, they were they were touching up the stones, and they invited coaches and players to come and watch the process. So yeah, we, um, we do that too. yeah, I think it's becoming a much more open um, discussion and open situation. Knowledge is power, right? Like, and, and everybody has the right to ask the questions. So yeah, good point. Absolutely. Both Scott and Don. Yeah. And Michael, thank you. And well, we're just, getting... Andrea, if I could sure, elaborate yeah, on that just for two seconds. Yeah, there, there's a very, a very fair and reasonable reason why it would be done at that point during an event. Because as teams are reaching the end of their round robin, we want to give everybody a fair assessment before we start getting into playoff games, which involve rock selection. So if you don't have, you know, I think Scott just said two days or at least, you know, two or three round robin games left to go, we're really asking the teams to choose rocks that they don't know, that, that, that because it's too late in the event, they haven't had a chance to, to, to get a, a feel or a handle or an assessment on which rocks they want heading into championship life. Good, good point. Well, we're coming close to the end. I, I would just like to um, confirm that the recording will come out to everybody as soon as it's available. I will also uh, try to find the YouTube um, video that Dawn referred to and put a link in the email with that. Please, um, if you're going to use the recording for any purposes, please ensure that you are using it for, um, not for commercial purposes, that you're using it to share with your team or to share with other coaches, simply to expand their knowledge as well. Thank you so much, Dawn. This has been um, very enlightening, and I, I, um, I'm sure that everybody out there is uh, has has learned a lot. Are you available if people have questions? Can they email you after the webinar? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, provide, or if you provide my email address, that would be uh, that'd be great. I will copy you on the recording. And so people will have your email address. And I see in the chat window that Scott has been Scotty on the spot and put in the uh, the YouTube link. So it's there. And I will copy it and ensure that it, it's in the um, email list for everybody. Thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. Stay tuned. There are more webinars coming up. Don't forget about the archived webinars if you're looking for PD points please uh, go online to the OCC website and uh, register for the archived webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Good night. Thank you.